Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, my name is Erwin Maas. I'm uh, an event curator at Studium Generale of Utrecht University, uh, uh, the public platform for knowledge and reflection. Um, we're live on uh, YouTube here from the uh, Academy Hall uh, with the last evening in a series about invisible violence, one that we've uh, co-organized with the Utrecht University Center of, uh, for Global Challenges. Um, a practical note uh, for those of you watching, if you have any questions or remarks, please enter them in the YouTube chat and my colleague uh, will send the questions and remarks to me and I will share them with our guest uh, tonight. Um, violence. It's uh, a complicated phenomenon. We're scared of it and we're drawn to it. Uh, we condemn it and we use it and it's a big taboo and at the same time it's everywhere. Um, violence is also something that we don't always see because it happens thousands of miles away, uh, maybe in suburbs that we never visit or uh, in behind closed doors. And when it eventually become becomes visible, that's when the battle over the interpretation starts. Was the act of violence justified or not? Um, in this series so far, we've talked about the causes of domestic violence against women uh, and the shady world of the international arms trade. And tonight we'll be talking about uh, a relatively new form of warfare, long distance wars. Uh, since 2008, uh, Western countries increasingly choose for remote warfare. Precision bombings, drone attacks, and targeted killings have largely replaced um, large-scale military interventions. Recent examples were, uh, were the, the killing of the Iranian general Soleimani by a U.S. drone and the Dutch bombing of Hawija in Iraq that killed 70 civilians. What caused this transformation of modern warfare, and how do these long-distance wars render violence invisible? To discuss the meaning and the consequences of this new form of, of warfare, violence, we've invited uh, political scientist Jolla Demers. She's a professor in conflict studies at Utrecht University, where she works on a research project called The Intimacies of Remote Warfare, which aims to inform the public about the realities of the remote wars that are waged in our names. So please give a, a warm digital applause for Jolla Demers. Thanks, Erin. Um, we're going to talk about remote warfare, and the question of this evening is how remote is remote warfare? But I'm going to start with a disclaimer, um, because this is a research um, that I do together with a team here at Utrecht University, uh, and it's called The Intimacies of Remote Warfare. Um, and I co-lead this with Lauren Gould, and our team members are Neil Watson, Jack Davies, David Snetselaar, Marit Woutwijk, and Isa Soetbrood. So this is a team effort. Okay, this evening we're going to talk about remote warfare uh, in a series about invisible violence. And in this case, we're going to talk about the wars we don't see or we don't see enough of. Now, what is remote warfare? Why do we see it now? And why does it matter? Those are the three core questions that I'll talk through uh, this evening. And since we have to compete with the eight o'clock news, I'll resort to a, a preview first. So this is why it matters. That's our last question. This is the violence that you don't very often see. These are the wars you do not see. Um, but this is also the violence that is exercised in our name, in your name. The Netherlands is one of the most active partners in the US-led war against ISIS in Syria and Iraq. And this war is named Operation Inherent Resolve. And here you see Raqqa, the ruins of Raqqa, a city in Syria that I'll come back to later. We have carried out about 3,000 combat missions with F-16s, the Netherlands that is, between 2014 and 2018, of which the strike on Hawija is the most known. As a whole, the coalition has been responsible for 34,000 strikes, dropping over 100,000 bombs over Syria and Iraq. And the aim of the operation is to defeat ISIS and to create enduring security. 
While the coalition described its campaign as the most precise in history, significant civilian casualties have been reported in both Iraq and Syria. The monitoring agency Air Wars has counted between 8,000 and 13,000 civilian deaths, but the coalition has only admitted to 10% of that number, only 1,400. And these then are the dead. Coalition airstrikes have ruined large parts of cities such as Raqqa, Mosul, and Hawija, and destroyed livelihoods and infrastructure. But let's talk about Raqqa. By the time the offensive to capture Raqqa began in June 2017, ISIS had ruled the city for almost four years. Previous investigations by Amnesty International and others detailed how the terror group had perpetuated war crimes and crimes against humanity, torturing and killing anyone who dared to oppose it. However, as a new study reports, made by Amnesty International, most of the destruction during the battle for Raqqa was caused by incoming coalition air and artillery strikes with at least 21,000 munitions fired into the city over a four-month period. And here you see the map of Raqqa and how 11,000 um, um, buildings were destroyed. The United Nations has declared Raqqa the most destroyed city in Syria with an estimated 70% laid waste. Both Amnesty International and Air Wars have frequently shared their findings on civilian harm at Raqqa with the US-led alliance. As a result, the coalition has so far admitted responsibility for killing 159 civilians, around 10% again of the minimum likely toll, according to the new study. So how remote is remote warfare? Well, remote warfare has become much less remote since Hawija. On the night of 3 June 2015, a coalition airstrike targeted an ISIS munitions factory in Havija. A large supply of close to 40,000 pounds of TNT stored in the factory detonated after the first strike. The destructive power of the explosions was immense and was reportedly felt in Kirkuk, about 50 kilometers away. The impact of the shockwave from the secondary explosions reached the diameter of more than two kilometers and left a six meter deep crater. The local hospital treated 200 victims on the night of the bombing. According to the general hospital's director, some were badly wounded, others died here. Among them are refugees from the south. Nobody knows them and no one misses them. The director concluded that there were very probably more fatal victims that the official, than the official number of 70 civilians that was reported by the International Red Cross and Reuters. And other sources also indicated that it is likely that there are much more bodies buried under the rubble. It was not until four years later, in late 2019, following the publication of a major investigation by NOS and NRC, the Dutch media organizations, that the Dutch Ministry of Defense eventually publicly took responsibility for the airstrike. Ironically, soon after the attacks of June 2015, the then Dutch Minister of Defense, Janine Hennis Plasgaard, had informed her parliament that although she could not disclose any exact information about Dutch airstrikes due to national and operational security, she could relay that as far as known at the moment, the Netherlands has not been involved in any instances of civilian casualties caused by airstrikes in Iraq. Not only did Hannes at the time lie about the civilian casualties, she underlined why it was uncalled for to question the precise nature of the airstrikes, stating that the targeting process is so precise that we've had, uh, we've had not had any indications so far adding that it is not as if you can destroy a whole suburb or district because of the smart weapons I was just telling you about. And I have to give you the Dutch translation. Nederland maakt uitsluitend gebruik van zogenaamde smart weapons, dus GPS of laser gestuurd en met een board cannon, en opereert dus heel precies. Je kunt ook een gedeelte van een gebouw bombarderen. Het is zo precies, het is niet zo dat je gelijk een complete wijk of regio platlegt. Dat komt door die smart weapons waarover ik net sprak. In het algemeen overleg in de Tweede Kamer. 30 juni 2015. 
So at the time, Minister Hannes' denial of civilian casualties was no coincidence. On 19 June 2015, the Dutch cabinet decided to prolong their participation in the anti-IS coalition, not disclosing the large amount of civilian deaths and destruction that had occurred in Hawija just weeks earlier, prevented parliamentary questions and possible public outcry. And this allowed Hannes to keep pursuing a continuation of the Dutch involvement in the anti-IS coalition. To members of the Dutch public, Hawija came as a surprise. Apparently, the Netherlands has been at war over the past years. And the Ministry of Defense had preferred to keep this war a secret. And apparently, the language of precision did not meet the realities on the ground. So what's going on? In this talk, I address three questions. What is remote warf warfare and why do we see it now? What does this tell us about the changing nature of war? And why is it problematic? So let's start with the first question. What is remote warfare? And why do we see it now in these times? Now, Western democracies increasingly resort to remote warfare to govern security threats from a distance. Remote warfare is characterized by a shift away from boots on the ground, deployments towards light footprint military interventions, and involves a combination of drone strikes and air strikes, very often the use of private contractors, as well as military training teams that then assist local forces to do the actual fighting and killing and dying on the ground. Also the Netherlands became involved from NATO bombings on, Ser on Serbia and Kosovo in the late 1990s, and then Iraq 2003, Libya, and from 2014 onwards, again, Iraq and Syria. Now, whereas perhaps the bombing of Serbia in the 1990s could be understood as an attempt to end a civil war, the later military operations are all about protecting Western lives against new enemies and threats. Violence is thus exercised and it's facilitated, but without the exposure of Western military men and women to opponents in a declared war zone, under the conditions of mutual risk, which is sort of the traditional definition of war. In this first part, I'll explore why we see this shift to remote warfare and review the political challenges that this new way of war has given rise to. And the key argument is that the secrecy and denial of remote warfare operations, their portrayal as precise and surgical, as well as the asymmetrical distribution of death and suffering that they entail, blocks democratic political deliberation on contemporary warfare. And I argue that it are these qualities of secrecy, precision, and asymmetry um, of remote warfare that will make Western liberal democracies not less, but more war prone. And this is perhaps the remote warfare paradox. The military violence executed is rendered so sanitized that it becomes uncared for and even ceases to be seen as war. So now how can we explain remote warfare? Why do we see this new interventionism? Why now? If we look at that debate in, in the academ academia, we see different genres of explanations uh, that answer that question. And I'll address three of them here. So we see war fatigue as a reason, democratic risk aversion, and technology. So let's start with the first one, war fatigue, the first genre of answers. Um, often refers to the horrors of interventionist ground wars that we saw in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and how they invoked a sense of war fatigue, ushering in a pullback era. The US and its coalition partners have combined a resort to precision airstrikes with a shift to much smaller clandestine and more focused interventions since. And the second genre is about democratic risk aversion. And here the argument is that it is democracies particularly, that turned to remote warfare as a way of risk aversion. Simply put, 
decision maker in democracies fear losses among their constituencies more than authoritarian leaders do. Because rising numbers of casualties, they fear, will have adverse effects on public support and will lower their chance of re-election. So basically, that's the argument. That's why in democracies, there's a strong appeal to turn to remote technologies of warfare instead of sending ground troops, simply to have less costs and therefore less risks politically. The third genre is, is technology. So the turn to military robotics and drones in particular is seen as key feature of remote warfare. And although the relation between technology and war is, is an old one, the, the recent revolution in military technology and the emergence of a military tech complex is seen to be the main driving force behind remote warfare. So we've entered in a new and very profitable arms race with tech corporations such as Microsoft and Amazon, Palantir and Anduril, importantly feeding the remote warfare machine. So this, the basic viewpoint here is that artificial intelligence, autonomous weapon systems will radically push for and transform warfare and will have us turn to these remote ways of war. So what does this tell us about the changing nature of war? So let's look at our second question. How has war transformed then? Now, although offering important insights into the design of warfare, um, the three perspectives just mentioned overlook more fundamental and classic questions of war. War is always an alternative system of profit and power and protection. Wars are produced, they're made to happen by a diverse and often complicated set of actors who may well be achieving their goals in what looks like failure and breakdown. And what we see is that conventional ties between war and space and time increasingly become undone. War is becoming temporarily open-ended and endless, as well as spatially dispersed. It becomes mobile. Now, why? Why, why is this? There's, there's two more fundamental reasons that I'd like you to, uh, to talk, that I'd like to talk about briefly. And that is military neoliberalism on the one hand and the global war on terror on the other. So in contrast, so start with military neoliberalism. In contrast to the era of classic imperialist and colonial rule, control over territory or even a population is no longer uh, the stake of the global power struggle. The power of the state today depends about, upon credit ratings. It, it depends on its corporate capacity and on its global market shares, not necessarily on the capture of territory. Control over resources is of key importance, but access now is arranged through free trade agreements, through leasing and contracting, large-scale land sales and forestry permits. So with a wink at von Clausewitz, Sigmund Baumann states that today's wars look like the promotion of global free trade by other means. We can also call this neoliberal, uh, military neoliberalism. Uh, as, a, as a useful shorthand, perhaps, for the increasingly military means whereby the state seeks to make the world safe for global capital. And this is why states such as the US and now copied by others such as France and, and China, exercise a very different form of control, something they call shaping, shaping the security environment. And this is not necessarily a very new doctrine. It was already thought up in the late 1990s in the US Department of Defense. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly describe how this doctrine is, is uh, is framed in, in, a, in, in the Ministry of Defense um, uh, report. So the, the Department of Defense has an essential role to play in shaping the international security environment in ways that promote and protect US national interests, the report says. To do so, the department employs a wide variety of means, including forces permanently stationed abroad, forces rotationally deployed, 
overseas, forces deployed temporarily for exercises, combined training or military to military interactions, and programs such as defense cooperation, security assistance, international, international military education and training programs, and international arms cooperation. So this is from a report uh, of the DOD uh, of 1997. What we see is a new understanding of military interventionism that shuns direct control of territory, but also of populations, and all its cumbersome order building and nation building and order maintaining responsibilities, focusing instead on shaping the international security environment through remote technology, through flexible operations and local partnerships. The doctrine of shaping, however, and the turn to remote warfare only really became possible after 9-11. So although the ideas were there in the, in the Department of Defense, it was hard to put them in practice. 9-11 changed all that. So, and the reason for this is a very brief 60-word resolution, which became law on September 18, 2001, a full week after the 9-11 attacks. And this, this very brief resolution of only 60 words authorizes the use of the United States Armed Forces against those responsible for the September 11 attacks. And it's called, the resolution is called Authorization of the Use of Military Force. And it reads as follows, 60 words that the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. One sentence, 60 words. California Democratic Congresswoman Barbara Lee delivered the only vote in Congress in that week on that day, opposing the 2001 resolution. In the days after the 9-11 attacks, there was tremendous pressure um, on, on members of Congress uh, to stand united and to, to, to help protect the country. And there's an, an anecdote in which Barbara Lee accounts of these days after the attacks, when the drumbeats of war sounded ever louder in the halls of Congress and, and the rubble of Ground Zero was, was basically still smoldering, uh, Lee tells how she went to a memorial service at Washington National Cathedral and there took courage from the words of Reverend Nathan Baxter because in his service, he remarked on the very tough choice and trusted to America's leaders about what now to do after these attacks. But he also warned that as we act, we not become the evil we deplore. And that sentence pushed Lee to vote against the resolution because she thought it would be a carte blanche for unlimited and endless violence so that as we act, we not become the evil we deplore, was what pushed her to vote against the resolution as the only Congress uh, woman or person in the House. Since the authorization of the use of military force, so since the resolution um, has been, uh, become law, uh, it has been used as a justification for continuing US military actions all over the world, up until today. So these include Afghanistan, Cuba, Guantanamo Bay, but also Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Georgia, Iraq, Kenya, Libya, the Philippines, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen. And only last year, in November 2019, the authorization of the use of military force was referred to, um, was referred to the grounds for the occupation of Kurdish-controlled Syrian oil fields. Maybe you remember that as the Trump administration sought legal authorization to maintain a military presence in the area. And perhaps you remember um, Trump saying, we're, we're keeping the oil, I like oil, 
we keeping their oil? And he could do that. Um, he could legitimize the military presence in, uh, in Syria based on this uh, resolution. So what we see is that we're moving from a geocentric to a target-centric conceptualization of war. War is no longer confined to a declared zone of conflict, a classic battlefield where the rules of war apply. The whole world is a battlefield, or rather a hunting ground. So we see a fundamental transformation of warfare from the use of mutual violence in a declared war zone to the unilateral use of force anywhere, anytime in the world from drone strikes to targeted killings and airstrikes. And again, these attacks are often executed in secrecy or under the medical discourse of precision and care and have almost always zero risks on our side. So what does this tell us about war? And what does, what does it tell us about the essence of war, really? Now, War is the institution of violence. And traditionally, we've learned that war is armed conflict, which should be always restricted to a geographical zone where the parties in conflict have, have an equal right to kill each other. So war is the only time in which homicide is legal, so to say, and to which then, of course, also these special laws of war apply. But more fundamentally, maybe the ontology of war is, we would argue, is the always uncertain reworking of meaning, truth, and order through violent means. And this is exactly what we're seeing over the past decades. From the Bush global war on terror and the ground wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, to Obama's massive and secret drone program and its targeted killings and airstrikes on Libya and Syria and Iraq, to Trump's drone strike on the Iranian General Soleimani that Erwin referred to, uh, who was an official representative of a state uh, of a foreign country who was targeted by a drone attack, we see how new ways of warfare become thinkable and become practiced and then become normalized. Ironically, Trump broke the rule of targeting a state official in a drone attack for the first time but he also broke the unwritten rule of covering up his violent action. And indeed, to the US establishment, he was indeed the most dangerous president ever, not because of his violent actions necessarily, for Trump is much less of a global imperialist than his predecessors, but because he was way too upfront about the real intentions and interest underlying his use of military force. So Trump is a sort of food-dragging imperialist and a way too transparent truth-teller about the real motives behind US foreign policy. With Biden in the White House, we'll, we'll definitely now return to a much more dignified face. But I fear cloaking a no less violent foreign policy. But we still have to see that. We're moving to the third topic and the final topic. What are now the, the political challenges? Um, and, and why is remote warfare problematic? Now, let me be clear. I do not argue for more um, boots on the ground or more Western body bags. What we as a research program on the intimacies of remote warfare aim for is, is the need to make strange the evolving normalization of remote warfare as, as somehow the lesser evil as precise and as efficient wars of necessity, as, as careful as humane violence, perhaps. Western democracies have largely removed their military from the theaters of war. And Western soldiers thereby no longer engage in hostilities directly. But this does not make them any less violent. For let's not forget, precision killings are still killings. Apart from making visible the direct suffering caused by remote warfare, we aim to think through the transformative effects and political challenges that this new way of war has given rise to. And key to the continuation of remote warfare, in addition to the secrecy of its operation and the propaganda of precision and care, 
is again its asymmetrical distribution of death and suffering. Now, what is, what is hopeful in the current debate that evolved after Hawija, for instance, is that there's now a growing critique on the precision of precision warfare. Um, and there's, there's been articles in newspapers and, and debates on, on television about this. However, what worries us is that instead of asking more fundamental questions, the debate now focuses on how to make war more precise, really precise, more perfect. As for instance is now suggested by the NRC, NRC the Dutch newspaper this weekend, um, in their, in their uh, very in-depth investigation of the Hawija uh, bombings, their conclusion is that we have to bring in more surveillance drones before we start bombing, so we can bomb more precisely and more perfect. What is not talked about and what seems to be carefully avoided are concerns about the utility of violence or questions about a state's entitlement to use it, the logic of violence. Nobody asks the inconvenient questions. Why are we bombing these cities? What is the root cause of this violence? Will it produce more violence in the future? Are there alternatives? And what is the justification for the destruction of the lives of, of millions, of, 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 of the lives and livelihoods of, of millions of others to protect ourselves from much more limited attacks? And more importantly perhaps, or most importantly perhaps, have we not become the evil we deplore? So instead, debate focuses around a more narrow set of issues. Has the Netherlands acknowledged the number of its civilian victims? Did a strike achieve goal, its goals of proportionality and were enough precautions taken? Was it precise enough? And so on. As we've seen in the above, zero-risk warfare is compelling to those not at the receiving end of the violence. But we fear that the debate on perfecting war will only translate into liberal democracies becoming not less, but more war prone. And a second major concern is blowback. The, the riskless setup of remote warfare could very well justify a mirroring, a mimicking of remote ways of fighting in the form of terrorist attacks as the only possible way to retaliate. And as for the secrecy of remote violence, one thing is clear. In this age of digital media, everything is seen. Everything is filmed and everything is shared. Violence always has a boomerang effect. So wrapping up, outsourcing the violent act to distant robotic or local actors has silently taken political deliberation out of contemporary warfare. And this has lowered the threshold for military engagement in liberal democracies. So we need to bring politics and we need to bring the public back in. For this, we need more analysis, dissemination and debate on the intimate realities of remote warfare. Because what's become clear, Western democracies claim to the moral high ground in respect to the brutality of war are uncalled for. All war is terrible, whether it's executed by a soldier piloting a weaponized drone or an insurgent's improv improvised explosive. There's no thing as sophisticated violence. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so um, we're open for questions. So if you have any questions or uh, remarks, please uh, type in YouTube chat and my colleague will send the questions uh, to me, uh, to my uh, phone. So um, the first question I got was a sort of personal question. Um, oh boy. How do you deal with all this horror as a person <laughs> academic? I mean, researching violence and you know, researching situations like the, the Havija attack. How do you deal with that as a person? Well, yeah, that's a personal question. Yeah, I think as an academic, um, this is basically the question of what's the role of the academic in today's society? Mm. 
And I, th I feel very privileged being an academic and, and having this place in university to, to independently do research on things that matter. And I think increasingly the university is one of the last places where we can do independent research. We hmm. don't have to think about how our editor may add out some of you know, the inconvenient questions that we'd like to pose or that we only have 30 minutes or 30 seconds on, on a show, mm -hmm. uh, or that we have to make sure that you know, the foreign, foreign uh, ministry is again hiring us as a consultant. We yeah. don't have that worry. So we have this fantastic space and privilege. And I think as an academic, therefore we also, or I feel that I'd like to use that to ask the inconvenient questions mm. and f do research on issues that are difficult and painful. Um, and I feel, uh, yeah, we as intellectuals have this responsibility to, to uncover that what has, you know, better remains uh, invisible as, mm -hmm. as the topic of this, uh, yeah. of this uh, Studium Generale. So that motivates me incredibly. So in that sense, um, that makes it possible to deal with the, the horrors that, yes, are, of course, constantly there. So be, yeah. be, because you know you're, you're doing an important thing, it's easier to sort of deal with I the, think so, the, yeah. the horrors that, yeah. that you see. Yeah, because there's so much work to be done when it comes to, to independent and painful and inconvenient uh, research. Yeah. And I, I feel a strong um, need to do that. And I also, yeah, I see this in students as well, that that really motivates them to actually do this kind of, of work mm -hmm. and, um, and not, f not maybe even the opposite of, of, it, of becoming depressed or, 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 or yeah, um, yeah, depressed or, 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 or sad about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it actually so energizes us, I think. So uh, how, how, how did you start researching violence? Oh boy! Well, that's a, that Now we go back all to the autobiography. Yeah, but then uh, then then we go uh, yeah, back to your yeah. talk. Of course, yeah, I've been I've been fascinated studying violence since uh, since very very early age on. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was um, there's this there's this one little anecdote uh, where apparently I was only ten years old, and my my dad who'd been sort of a traditional father, sort of you know sort of butchered me and sort of I had to go to my room and I sort of I did apparently did something that he didn't like and um, and then I wrote a little note and I must have picked it up from you know from from the newspapers or something and it said violence is a sign of powerlessness and I put <laughs> that on the on the on the door of my room and you so were 10 years old I was 10 years old so geweld is a teken van machteloosheid mm. which I later understood comes from Hannah Arendt Mm -hmm. who makes that claim. Um, so you, it started do, do really you, early. Do you, do you yeah. support that claim? It's, I think it's very interesting. Now, now, yeah. it's, a very interesting um, uh, it's a very interesting way of looking at violence hmm. um, and, uh, of, and, and conceptualizing power as something... Power is the capacity to act collectively, hmm. in her words. So power is to be able to act in, um, yeah, as a group, that's real power. And only if you actually do not have that capacity, if you're not legitimate, if you're not, you know, representing the people in, in some sort of swollen words, mm. then you have to resort to violence to actually, you know, keep your position in place. Yeah. And that idea of that w real power, true power and violence are actually opposites mm -hmm. is something that, of course, she brought she gave us to, to, to ponder on. And, and, uh, how, how, how does that relate to, to the talk you just gave? Yeah, I think we, we, we do see this in, in, our, in the world, that those who, um, um, yeah, that, that those who have the capacity to use violence uh, without impunity are not necessarily the ones who hold legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely something we see. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I got a question from uh, Jack. Jack. Uh, research has shown that a majority of Americans would accept killing two million Iranian civilians through a first use nuclear strike if it would save the lives of 20,000 US soldiers. How do we contend with this preference when trying to highlight the problems with remote warfare? Is bringing the civilian harm impact into the public consciousness enough to change public opinion? Hmm. I wonder which Jack that is. <laughs> uh, I, I, w 
would argue that, first of all, I would contest those, th those numbers, hmm. and I would contest that kind of research, that you cannot ask anyone that question, and, and expect that people can ex answer that in any mm -hmm. serious way. Yeah. So I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that this kind of stupid trade-off question is, is seriously what people think. Um, so first of all, I would dismiss the type of research that, that, that sort of presents us with these yeah, kinds I mean. of findings. I think these are false, mm -hmm. false oppositions and false findings. And, and in, maybe in the sort of the real depth of that question is, do we care enough about others to, to, um, to, to want to accept um, proportionality and to, to, you know, to, to, to think about these things in, in more humane ways? Mm -hmm. Um, and and then, then you go all the way down to who are we as human beings and what is our ontology. And of course we can, we, we can disagree on that, but I think in, in, yeah, I don't really have an answer to that big question about whether we are good or evil mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, but I think we should not be presented with these kinds of choices. I think it's not necessary to have to have these kinds of binaries presented to us as, as some sort of real reality, as if indeed the Iranians are such a threat to our existence that we are willing to sacrifice these mm -hmm. kinds of numbers. I think that is purely politics and power, and we should, we should refuse to be placed in that, in that position to, to make that choice. Yeah. Um, Follow-up question from Jack. <laughs> Do you see any potential with the incoming Biden administration for a rethink of militarized counterterrorism? Yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting. It doesn't look good if you look at who Biden, and this is not, this is not um, confirmed yet, but mm. the, the news that has come out so far about who, who Biden likes to invite into his administration, and certainly when it comes to his choice for possible ministries of defense and secretaries of state, uh, these are the old establishments of the more the global imperialists, mm. those who would want to be the world's policemen and who are in favor of, um, of, of a more aggressive uh, um, foreign policy. So those are the people who worked for the Obama administration yeah. and yeah. maybe for the, the Clinton administration yeah. Yeah. as well? Yeah, like Flor Noy, for instance. She, mm. was, she was actually, uh, um, so that is the possible, but we don't know yet for sure, possible new... Um, um, uh, Ministry of, of, of Defense, uh, U.S. Minister of Defense. She was actually one uh, uh, who crafted this shaping uh, doctrine in, in the 1990s. She was also the one who convinced Biden to, to support Biden as, as vice president um, to support the intervention in Libya. So, yeah, if you look at how this is shaping up, I do expect that we're going to see a much more dignified face, a, mm -hmm. a, a, a language of human rights and, and humanitarian aid and um, responsibility to protect, um, but a no less violent um, foreign policy. Mm. A question from uh, RJS. Um, as you state, there currently is an asymmetry in death and suffering through superior Western military technology. Isn't it only a matter of time until other actors catch up, be able to uh, retaliate, uh, retaliate, and thereby creating more of a deterrence against violence? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Um, and it's a good question to sort of imagine what that would look like um, and to also anticipate on and to also reflect upon in, in debating our own violence and our own future violence. Mm. Um, as, as far as we're standing now, this arms race of autonomous weapon systems, the US is absolutely leading and the rest of the, of the you know, the, the states are, are far behind. Israel, China um, are, are not close to, to the capacities of, of the US, but of course, you know, it's, it, is, it is absolutely true that this may change in the future. Hmm. So Im imagine a world where China would decide to target any unwelcome figure in the U.S. administration or in the Dutch administration for, for reasons of I don't know exactly what, mm -hmm. uh, and decides to sort of you know, use a drone to use a targeted killing to, to, um, 
to neutralize this person. You know, it's, for us, it's unimaginable that that, that could happen. You yeah. know, that would mean war and we'll retaliate. Um, but it's good, it's good to do that kind of mirroring and to, this sort of reversal thinking and to also see how our actions are actually experienced by those who are at the receiving end of our violence. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's a good exercise, I think. Um, does the public opinion matter in the case of remote warfare? Was there enough outrage, for example, over the bombings the Dutch did and the Minister of Defense's response? No, there was no outrage. Um, when was it? 2003, so that's um, 17 years ago. Um, we had m quite, quite big demonstrations against the invasion in the upcoming invasion uh, in Iraq. In March, I remember join. I, I don't like demonstrations. I don't like walking in masses, but I, I did participate. I was pregnant at the time, hmm. um, so I remember that vividly. And, th and those were a lot of people on the streets who really thought, if this is going to happen, if we're going to have this invasion, this war in Iraq, this is going to be, that's you know, this is going to escalate into all kinds of of, of ugly. Uh, uh, developments and we should really stop that. So at that moment in time, worldwide, there was, there was quite a, uh, a collective action uh, force. Um, I don't see any of that now. Um, and I think that is exactly because so far states have been very capable of, of, of keeping the precision and the secrecy um, uh, very, very much uh, um, in, in sort of center stage. And there's been too few voices trying to um, uncover that and do research on what really happens on the ground. And I still think that's, that's a big pity that, you know, wonderful investigative journalists such as the NRC uh, now write this piece and spend so much time on investigating the Hawija bombings, but in the end, the best they can come up with is we need more drones to, yeah, uh, to do make it, it even more you know, perfect. For the next war, we're prepared better and have our own intelligence and can bomb more precisely. Mm -hmm. We should ask the fundamental questions now about why are we there in the first place? Mm. Why is this bombing bringing us enduring security for us and for those who are living, uh, living in Iraq and in Syria? Is this the real solution? Is this also strategically useful? Mm -hmm. also, also technically military? Is this a wise uh, decision? And um, where is the public? Where is, where is the Tweede Kamer? Where is mm -hmm. Parliament in all this? So why, uh, why aren't these questions being asked? That's, that's well, that's, that's, that's sort of my, my uh, and, and our team's obsession that apparently we don't do our work enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't have enough Studium Generale sessions and we don't write our opeds or we don't get them published enough mm -hmm. to actually get this debate started. But that's exactly our call, to get this debate started, to mm -hmm. start investigating and start talking about this, mm -hmm. because millions of lives are, are lost. And, you know, and yeah, one way or the other, we have to talk about that. When, when, when I was listening to your story, I was, I was, I was thinking, where, where is the UN? in all of this. I mean, they were, they were supposed to sort of, you know, be this, 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 this institution that, that could uh, sort of oppose this, this kind of warfare. Where, yeah. where, where are they in, this, in yeah. this story? It's a very good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. I don't see them. I think, it, yeah, of course, the, you know, the, 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 as I said, this, 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 this resolution of, of the week after 9-11, is actually the legal ground for the U.S. military actions, yeah. and it's going outside any of the U.N. Uh, legal frameworks. That that that, and also against all kinds of international law and international humanitarian laws. Um, that, of course, the Netherlands does try and stick to, uh, but you see how very very influential it is. If if you have this resolution that allows the president to do this kind of um, endless and this everywhere and every, uh, every time war, uh, how hard it is uh, for smaller countries such as the Netherlands not to be lured into that doctrine and into that dynamic and to sort of push international humanitarian law as, and to stretch the boundaries of what, what is legitimate, I'd say, in, in, in throwing bombs on Syria, legitimizing that through the idea of collective self-defense, that we're throwing bombs on Syria because we help protect Iraq against ISIS. Mm. But then, 
You know, that's a, that's a stretch. And to be the country of international law and the Hague center of, you know, the world of international law, it's very painful to see how willing the, 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 the Netherlands is, 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 is you know, to, in, in terms of stretching the law to, to just get on board um, militarily. Yeah. And why that is, yeah, those are, those are questions that we have to probe and we have to bring out into, into the open and have debated in, in, in Parliament and have sessions on uh, with students and, and in Studium Generale and mm. other places. But yeah. we need to debate this. And for that, to be able to debate it, we have to have information. Yeah. And we're making a start there. I think in that sense, you know, it's great to see newspapers spending time, uh, very expensive time on the few investigative journalists they still have to actually try and start digging into these cases more. Yeah. I'm just a little frustrated to see the, the, kind, of, uh, the kind of results then uh, are purely focusing on proportionality, was the, was the procedure followed correctly, mm -hmm. and what can we do next time to be more precise in our killings. Yeah. Um, also, the, the, the commission um, that is headed, I forgot who's, who's heading it. There's going to be this independent commission researching Havija. Mm -hmm. Zorgdrager is going to, to lead that commission, but we already see that that's going to be completely internal affairs again. Yeah. Looking at procedures, looking at protocols, and not going to Hawija, not investigating what is actually happening on the ground. How, how, has, how has, you know, have these bombs changed and impacted livelihoods, infrastructure, futures um, of, of citizens? And what does that do to violent imaginaries of who's responsible for this, who destroyed mm -hmm. our lives, um, and how can we retaliate, or how can we in some way compensate for this? So if that's never addressed, then we're constantly building our, our own Frankensteins, mm. as we've, of course, done. You know, 2003 Iraq was the beginning of the building of Frankensteins that are still leading in the Middle East. Hmm. So it's always, re it's always boomeranging back one yeah. way or the other. So even, you know, if we disagree on a lot of things, I think even strategically, militarily, uh, we could have a good debate on whether we need to be doing this uh, in terms of, of sort of military strategy and mm -hmm. containing violence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't it also this, this sort of firm belief in, um, in the power of technology that sort of underlies this... Yeah. this whole rhetoric. Well, I think also the, also the fun of, of trying out new weapons. I think what we now just saw the past, was it today or yesterday, where this uh, um, Iranian uh, uh, scientist... Nuclear scientist, yeah. Yeah, was apparently, and this is not, not corroborated yet, but apparently the accusation by Iran is that he was killed by remotely controlled um, um, uh, machine guns. So another sort of geek must have been really happy to sort of test out you know, not the drone yeah. precision attack, but now let's use a car with remote controlled machine guns. Let's try out that, that tool. Of course, there's always it's like been a game, this. right? Yeah, and, and of course, we as people have always been fascinated by technology and trying out new things. And, and the war industry, as, as I think the, the other talk in, in Studium Generale uh, was about, is a massive, massive uh, machine. Um, the, 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 the military industrial tech complex is yeah. of course uh, very, very powerful and, and very, very uh, lucrative and profitable. Yeah. So that's a force in itself. Yeah, it's, it's, it fits in this, this idea of the, of the military neo neoliberalism that, that you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But that's not new, um, no. I'd say. So um, again, um, you know, I, I still, I'm still, <laughs> Well, hopeful is maybe a wrong word, but I still think that th this happens in democracies. Um, it's particularly democratic countries who resort to these types of remote warfare. Mm -hmm. For one, because we have the money, because we're, we're highly developed. Um, and the other reason is, of course, because we are so fearful for having body bags brought home. Yeah. So we do want to invest a lot in this. But at the same time, we're also democracies. So we have parliaments and we can inform our parliament and, and try and, and our, our electorate and convince them that this is simply suicidal and not smart um, and have you know, debates about this and make sure that there's good controls about 
who decides on, on, on when to wage war mm -hmm. and how to inform parliament, not yeah. like happened in 2015 where everything's covered up. Still things are not being uh, uh, disclosed. There's still a lot of secrecy. And that has to change. There has to, we have to have a debate about that to inform parliament so there's control on the use of force. Yeah. And particularly within democracies, then there's, there's room for, for doing things differently and thinking otherwise. Yeah. So it can be done. So a question from uh, Neil Wilson. That would be a, that would be a f beautiful last sentence, right? Yeah, that would have been a beautiful last sentence, yeah. but, <laughs> but. <laughs> still have some questions. Um, a question from uh, Neil Wilson. Uh, in a recent interview, uh, Statis uh, Kalivas warned against scholars of violence advising policymakers or becoming involved in policy projects due to the risk of it being used to justify violence. Do you agree with uh, this assessment? Do you think the study of remote warfare can be reconciled with the policy world? Here, here. Hmm. Yeah, Statis Kalivas. Um, no, I think, I think that, that sort of maybe goes back to the first answer I gave about how incredibly important it is to have independent research um, and to have investigative journalists given the room to do their independent research and to have that done in the university where we, we don't have to uh, cater or we, we don't have to be afraid about funding you know, that, that's going to end, but where we can really speak truth to power and do independent research and, and come up with our empirical results. So yes, I think we should have a, a conversation with the Ministry of Defense. We're having uh, conversations. We, we are in, you know, in dialogue with, with the ministry. And I think that is important. We should not lock ourselves up in our ivory tower and just be very angry mm. and, and write difficult, difficult, um, uh, articles and, and just stay within our bubble, um, and we don't. In the intimacies of remote warfare, we are actively engaged with NGOs and the ministry to actually bring this to the table. And, mm. um, and there is openness to debate things, up until certain limits, but the conversation is there. So, yeah, but it should be done independently. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question. So you think that documentaries such as uh, for Sama or other about the wars that stay out of sight can be of any help? Can it make people ask questions or um, sort of cause outrage? Yeah, great question. Uh, absolutely fundamental, hmm. I think. Um, you know, academics with our poor capacity to, to, to sort of communicate in a way, you know, our language is limited. The, the power of our language is, is, is limited. Um, and of course the arts, and particularly film and documentary making, is such a strong tool to actually bring the story home and to really use not just, you know, the, the cerebral and the, and the intellectual, but also emotions and, and empathy and um, um, understandings. And that can only be done, I think, through, through art and film. So I think without that we, we'd be lost. So mm. definitely For Sama is a great film. And, um, in, in, in most of our teaching at, at the Center for Conflict Studies and in our MA Conflict Studies, we, we force students to do lots of documentary uh, mm -hmm. watching um, to actually, yeah, to, to bring that in. Um, do, you, do you have another crucial. tip for our viewers at home? Oh boy. Yeah, I've got a whole list. Uh, but to see particularly a film about, about um, Contemporary warfare. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my 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 um, for Sama would be would be then th would be your the pick, one yeah. that I would pick. There's at, at this moment is at the uh, uh, ITFA, the International Documentary Festival in Amsterdam. There's quite a number of interesting films coming up. I haven't seen them yet, but I've seen that they are also about remote warfare uh, topics. So mm -hmm. my advice was to, would be to check that list out and see. Um, see if there's any films that relate to this topic. Yeah. Yeah. But by all means, go see documentaries and films. Yeah. Um, so question by Magdalena Vittoria. I think you've already answered it, or partly. Uh, thanks for the great lecture. What role would you say does the industry arms drones play in this increase uh, in remote warfare? Yeah, massively m pushing, particularly in the US. Um, there's, there's such a strong lobby. Uh, uh, congressmen and women are constantly lobbied by by this, um, you know, this this industrial tech complex. Um, there's going, there's a lot of money going around, and it's it's a very uh, strong 
um, sort of link with with the inner establishment of particularly the U.S. That is that is um, um, yeah a force to, to reckon with. So it's a, it's an important driving force. Uh, of course, always um, presenting um, answers to possible future questions with all new kinds of, of technologies, uh, catering very much to this to this fear for losing votes because of body bags brought home, mm -hmm. um, and and tapping right into into these into these feelings and, and fears of. Um, Fears by politicians to to not wanting to get into any kind of massive ground uh, war, um, but also indeed, as we talked about earlier, fantasies of precision uh, and perfecting war that also we as audiences have been sort of subjected to through popular media and through Marvel movies mm -hmm. and yeah. through sort of th if this can be done, you know, why not try it? Because we're going to save lives being precise, and we're going to do some kind of humanitized violence, sort of necroethics of killing with care, uh, that actually people start believing in as long as you, st you keep on telling that story. And yeah. we have to bring the counter-narrative that precision is not, is not precision, first and foremost, um, but step out of that entire um, sort of debate and, and have the fundamental questions, you know, put, put first and put uh, 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 center stage about why would we want to engage in any kind of violence in the first place? Hmm. Uh, what is your legal mandate and what is your strategy here? And how do you think you're going to sort of reach your aim of, of, of bringing security, enduring security, such as the Operation Inherent Resolve is, is, is promising us? Yeah. So um, th those should be the questions that we're debating first and foremost. So, so are, are we moving into an era where, where war actually never ends? Absolutely. That's yeah, that's what we're seeing now. That's the transformation I try to yeah. to sketch. Th that we're already right there. Uh, mm. We're already there for for 19 years in mm. in in an era of endless mobile war. War as a hunting game. Yeah. Yeah. But and, but that's but our reality. Yeah, but we we still call it war. Yeah. And I think it's good to call it war. I don't. I think it's good to not mm. le not leave that word or ditch that word. No, um, because it is. There's a lot of people dying. Um, there's a lot of people um, getting, you know, killed in precision, in, in precision bombing. So definitely, we are at war, but it's an endless war. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question: Fantasies of precision, safe uh, lives being precise, killing with care. Uh, I hear a lot of beautiful sentences and, and slogans, metaphors, describing something horrific. How does language matter? Good question. Um, yeah, language is, I think, at this moment, the big cover-up, and it's very attractive. It's very attractive language. I think if 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 if, if journalists uh, of the NRC are lured in by the language of precision, then um, you know the discourse is is doing its its work, mm -hmm. um, and we apparently also would like to believe that this is this is all true and possible, because it's a very convenient reality, right, where we can feel safe because there's a state who very strategically takes out the villain and leaves the poor family. Um, uh, alive, yeah. you know the the precision of just taking somebody, uh, uh, killing somebody in the in the driving seat of a car, and then having the one sitting next to him, you know, sort of completely intact. Yeah, th th those are sort of, I think, also popular culture plays an important role. I've got a teenager, a kid at home who watches all the Marvel movies, and that's exactly kind of the kind of script that we're also pretty much used to and, and probably seem seemingly like to live mm -hmm. by. Um, and there's not enough of a reality call coming from, from the news, coming from the academia, to say, hey, there's a different reality on the ground um, that we have to look at and debate, because this is not, this is not, there's a friction here. Yeah. yeah. And w w what would be an alternative uh, language? What would be alternative metaphors? For for precision killings, you mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, sort of better m metaphors to describe these wars and to show people that that this is this might not be what we want. No, what yeah, might, I think might just using the this. conventional words that this is these are these are airstrikes, these are bombardments. Yeah. 
Maybe you simply use the word bom bombardment. Yeah. Because everybody, with a, if you use bombardment, everything, everyone thinks about Rotterdam, you know, and, and, yeah. and about how we still haven't recovered and how the city of Rot Rotterdam ha still hasn't recovered, uh, how the traces of the bombings are still, you know, alive in a city such as Rotterdam, and it's 75 years ago, uh, and there's still monuments and there's still people and, and, and spaces that, that recall that past. Mm -hmm. So... And, 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 yeah, oh, how tragic it was, there were 800 civilians killed in, in that bombing. Yeah. So if you compare that to what happens in, in Iraq and Syria, then maybe that helps you to imagine what we're, at, what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So it's also, it's also a lot about empathy and imagination. But to have empathy and imagination, you have to have sources of information that are genuine, um, and that are, are, are you know, evidence-based and fact-checked that you can actually rely on. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we need good, solid investigations and have those disseminated and debated. And, yeah, I so do you, do you have repeating myself. Do, do you have examples of, of, of organizations that, that do good research that our, our viewers can go to? Absolutely. Go to Air Wars. Uh, an organization based in both London, but also here at Utrecht University, mm. uh, which is a monitoring organization, which is pure and only trying to keep track of civilian deaths through remote warfare um, uh, operations. Uh, it has a great website. Uh, it's very, very robust in its, in, its, uh, in its pretty horrific work of counting the bodies of the dead. So Air Wars is, is really important, but also Amnesty International is increasingly moving into that direction mm. of, of, of uh, civilian harm and has done quite fantastic research in Raqqa. Basically, Amnesty International is the first and the only one who came, uh, who brought us the story and the, and the evidence of, uh, of the Raqqa bombings, mm. uh, a city that was destroyed for 70% by our bombs in the sense of our coalition bombings. Um, so they did very convincing research, actually with a team of uh, UK students. Mm. Uh, so they worked together with UK, U, U, British universities and teams of students doing masters there to gather all that evidence. So um, Amnesty International report on Raqqa is, very, is a very good read. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly if you just go on the website of Air Wars and the intimacies of remote warfare, of you definitely find all your information, Good. robust, well-researched mm -hmm. information. Yeah. So we, we, we talked about um, the US and they have this sort of uh, monopoly on, on this remote warfare and, and other Western countries are, are, are following suit. Yeah. So, um, I mean, in, during the Trump administration, we've seen this sort of slow move away uh, from Trump by Europe. How do you see that evolving? Uh, and how do you sort of see a role for, for, for Europe in, in, in changing this, this, this discourse and rhetoric on, on remote warfare? Yeah, I don't see it. What I see mm. is the opposite. What I see is that Europe learns its lessons from you know, the retreat of the US in a way, hopes that Biden will, you know, will, will recover those relationships. But, but the European Union has, has taken up the message clearly that now we have to sort of stand on our own feet and have our own defense strategy and be much more independent strategically and militarily as, as Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, we also need our own drones and we need our own remote technology to be able to do our own remote warfare. Yeah. So th that is what we see happening. And that's also what we see um, now debated in the Netherlands, that we need our own surveillance drones. Uh, and how proud we are that we're going to have our four Reaper drones uh, next year or even mm -hmm. this year brought in. So uh, what we see is, is, is an, uh, a mimicking and a, an acceleration actually of, of bringing in the material and bringing in the technology mm. instead of a debate about is this actually where we would like to go. And so does it even happen in, in, in Germany? Because that's, that's a country that historically has yeah. been very hesitant to, to use violence. Do you see the same... Um, yeah, the debate is, is, at this moment, the debate that I'm knowledgeable of is, is the European debate, and yeah. there Germany is definitely, together with France, uh, a strong voice in, in, in building this independence. 
yeah. EU independence militarily. Mm. Yeah. So uh, another question. Um, so less body bags, yes, but how does pulling the trigger of a drone impact a soldier? Does remote warfare also cause PTSS? Yeah, it does. It does, apparently. And I find it very hard to feel pity. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, those poor pilots sitting in, in, in containers in the desert of Nevada, um, having to pull triggers, um, becoming traumatized because they've killed people uh, f seven, eight thousand kilometers away and then having to step out of their container and have pizza with their families. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not I'm sure they have their, 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 their problems, but I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if my empathy goes out to them first and foremost. Mm -hmm. No. All right. I think they, yeah, anyway. But they do. I mean, that's been researched. Yeah. 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 Okay, that, that was the last question. Okay. Um, if somebody has a question, please type in now, and I will see it. I'll Otherwise, remain um, silent forever. Yeah. yeah. Silent forever. Otherwise, um, I think we're going to finish. Uh, so please give a, a, a warm round of applause at home for Jolle Demers. Thank you. For a very interesting talk. Thank you so much. And um, uh, thank you for uh, watching. If you want more information uh, on our program, please check our website, sg.uu.nl. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.